Howdy, this is uh, going to be a little bit different from how I normally format content, but I'd like to talk about Windows a little bit today. So it's currently uh, the 28th of May 2025, and something big's going to change for me, and I thought I'd bring you guys along uh, for the ride. So what's happening? Windows is end of life in Windows 10. Uh, sorry, Microsoft is end of life in Windows 10. Now what that means is Windows 10 will still work, but there'll be no security updates. And being an IT nerd, security updates are still kind of important to me. Now, my history with Windows is a, an iffy one. So I've been using computers since I was a kid. I got my first DOS based PC when I was a young kid and you know quite familiar with just running a colon slash whatever the executable was and executing from floppies and stuff like that but as I got older we got newer versions of Windows 95 was cool it was new it was fresh it was something different um, 98 came out you know bit more of the same so on and so forth. We've had our goods and our bads, you know, Vista was a bit of a bomb, um, got fixed up a little bit, sort of like 8. Anyway, one of the big issues that I've had ever since about XP is the dumbing down of the interface. So things just tend to progressively get worse within um, the Microsoft ecosystem. So. Um, one of the big complaints I currently have is forced updates, so I don't get to choose when I install updates. Um, Windows updates also have a real bad habit of completely destroying my hardware configurations. So I am really meticulous, I'll sort of show you guys what I'm talking about. Um, so actually it might be easier this way, so let's bring up sounds. And so you might notice I have a few different devices here. On playback, I have a lot more. Now I've got to disable all these devices because they're not what I want audio to ever play back through. Now, whenever I run an update, especially a relatively large one, those devices will all end up enabled and it'll pick something random like this microphone to be the output for things. And then the input will be like this camera. And it's just absolutely insane the things that it does for no reason. And that's on the back of an update that I can't choose when to deploy either, aside from a blackout window that you can define. Um, so that's really problematic and that annoys the piss out of me. But then we've got settings, um, which I'll bring over here. Um, so we've got our settings thing. Yay, that's cool. I don't have an issue with a settings menu per se, right? My problem is that not everything is there because half of it is in control panel. So depending on what you want to change, you've got to use two different systems and that is shit and that annoys the piss out of me um, so being the IT nerd that I am I have dabbled a lot in Linux I currently actually have a, dedica a dedicated Proxmox server over here um, that actually runs numerous Linux VMs I've also got stuff like a Nutanix AHV hypervisor nested inside it, all sorts of stuff like that. I'm very familiar with Linux and I have used it for gaming in the past. And with the end of Windows 10 and how much I really don't like Windows 11 because it takes all the things I don't like about 10, makes it worse, I'm thinking, you know what, let's go back to Linux. now. One of my big problems heading back to Linux, like when I did it previously, uh, two problems. One was I was doing it on a laptop and it had an NVIDIA GPU. 
um, and that GPU was supposed to switch depending on what power source was supplied to it and so it would use the onboard APU, um, Intel APU for gaming and visuals while you were on battery power once you plugged it in it then would switch the Nvidia GPU that never worked uh, properly in Linux and it was because Nvidia didn't care um, and that's where the whole famous quote by Linus Torvalds which I'll throw up here uh, comes from okay. and Nvidia has been the single worst company we've ever dealt with so Nvidia fuck you <laughs> What I had other issues with was um, when you're like trying to play a game, a lot of it was just not natively supported. So like I have a Steam library of like 747 games currently um, and a GOG library of I think it's about 150 or so games. So that's like over 800 games but about 80% of them work natively in Linux. Uh, sorry, 20% of them work natively in Linux. 80% don't. And so because of this, it was basically you had to use Wine um, and Wine, which is, uh, it, it's not an emulator, but it it's basically a compatibility layer between Windows and Linux. It's not the best and it was kind of hard to use. Since then though, with things like Proton and Bottles, which is a much better method, things have gotten a lot better. And like pushing me to this even more was that I've now moved away from Adobe Premiere and Adobe Photoshop, which were my primary editing things for all the really badly done content that I make. Um, but um, now that I've moved away from that, pretty much all of my applications can run natively in Linux. It's just games that might be a problem. But since getting the Steam Deck and realizing that so much of it works natively on the Steam Deck, that says to me that like, no reason it can't work on a Linux desktop with a lot more grunt. And a lot of the problems with games not being natively supported is that they don't have things like um, like you may need to use a mouse for a moment and things like that or you may need to um, bring up the on-screen keyboard and so because of that they come up with compatibility warnings so with all of that said it makes me think let, let's jump to Linux so the plan is currently to move to Linux when this end of like becomes end of life so around that October time period. So that so was a fucking lie. That's sort of what the plan is. Now, what, like, for those of you who've never done something like this and who have never dealt with, like, my environment, because I do have a very specific environment, so I'll try to bring this up and sort of give you guys a bit of an idea. So this is what my storage looks like. So as you can see, internally I have, what is that? Do, 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 that's two terabytes plus four terabytes, six terabytes, and then another six. So that's 12 terabytes of internal storage. Um, and obviously C drive, that'll get blasted away. That doesn't matter. But like the games drives, these two, they can get blasted. That's no big deal. But documents and media all need to stay so that's like a migration process. Um, and then I've also got my network storage, which is a whole different kettle of fish. Um, so with all of that in mind, I've got to do some Linux prep. And so with this, what I'm doing to sort of orchestrate the migration is I'm going through and I'm getting all the apps that I sort of use regularly or need for my day-to-day -day operations um, and getting them and noting whether there are like Linux versions. A lot of this just has Linux versions natively, but then there's stuff like FUBAR, which is a music player, nothing on Linux. So I'll just have to find an alternative. It's a music player, it's not a big deal. 
uh, M Remote NG is what I use for RDP onto like some of my VMs and things like that. Um, I found that Remina is a recommended Linux alternative, so that's possibly something I'll look into. Um, my security camera system doesn't run at all and there are no alternatives because that's like the native application for it. So instead I'll um, have to look at emulating that through bottles or what have you. But then beyond that, um, I've got some other references to internal systems like bottles, flat pack, Latris, things like that. Um, and then I have sequenced up like a process of how I'm going to do this. So um, for example, like I've got a key pass password database. So that'll be migrated to my uh, cloud storage uh, before anything happens. Uh, my QSync, which is a file synchronization thing, um, will have to be paused, et cetera, et cetera. So I've got a whole system for how I plan to do this step by step. Um, and then what I need to do after that and what the install configuration needs to be. So these are all just the things that I've got to keep in mind to make sure this is as seamless as possible when I go over um, to Linux. Now, the next part of this will be probably some like, I guess, video diary type stuff as I'm doing it, problems I find along the way, things like that. So um, yeah. So here we are, all done moving to Linux. Linux Mint Cinnamon 22.1 to be specific. Now if you aren't familiar with what all that means, I'll try to keep it simple and quick. But Linux is the kernel, like the core of the operating system, and distributions are a way to use that Linux kernel to create a full operating system. So a distribution like Mint um, uses software packages to create the complete operating system, and Mint is a uh, user-friendly, um, easy to get running sort of distribution. It has a lot of pre-bundled software, stuff that I would have used anyway. So it just saves me the time to install it. And that's kind of why I went that route. Um, as for Cinnamon, what that refers to is the desktop environment. So the Mint team actually makes Cinnamon as well. And Cinnamon is just a kind of pretty desktop environment. I just thought it looked nice. Doesn't really make a difference, but people might choose different ones depending on the resources of their system or functions that they need, but Cinnamon does the job for me, so that's why I went that route. But how was the process? Pretty smooth in all honesty. Booting off a USB and installing the OS was all pretty straightforward. It's like installing any other OS, including like Windows. You just Click next, define an admin user, create partitions, set up networking, and away you go. The hardest stuff was definitely during the initial setup. Not because it was actually problematic at like an OS level or anything like that, but it was stuff like setting up my surveillance software. So like I've got um, security cameras around my house and the software that they use to watch live um, is Windows only and so I put that in bottles to try and run and it just would not run no matter what I did .NET versions changing compatibility just would not work I looked into it a little bit online and sure enough there is a very specific version of that software that does work in bottles and once I tracked that version down and installed it works perfectly so there was stuff like that um, there was also my password manager wouldn't import in the Linux version. So I had to actually export my passwords into a CSV file and then re-import them into the Linux version. 
but that was just annoying so I ended up moving to Bitwarden which has been brilliant since then so there's that. So outside of those sort of things which honestly I've had to do similar in new versions of Windows like if you ever went from Windows ME to XP or XP to Vista you'd probably understand. Um, a lot of the setup was stuff that I'd just done a hundred times before like mounting network devices in um, etcfs tab, um, installing stuff with apt via command line, um, using flatpak, stuff like that. Um, very little was actually required of command line except stuff that I willingly choose to do like editing hosts files and stuff. Um, so if you're someone that doesn't like working in a terminal or on command line you really don't have to do a whole lot with Linux these days um, via that means. A lot of it is very GUI centric and even processes that used to be purely command line usually have GUI front ends available now so that's really cool. The craziest part though is getting games to work. Like Night Rain is my current addiction and all I needed to do was install Steam, enable Proton and then just hit install. Once it installed I hit play and away I went. Now there were some frame rate issues and stuff like that that I had at first but I changed the version of Proton to the experimental version and it and like that's quite simple to do um, and most of those are resolved. It performs pretty much on par with what it did in Windows which is unlike anything that I've experienced in Linux before. Gaming in Linux for Windows based games was a nightmare. Native Linux games were amazing but there were so few that yeah if you went the Windows route it was they just ran like ass a lot of the time and so yeah to see it run this well is just absolutely amazing. And not to mention like things like my wireless controller, um, my mouse, my keyboard, everything just worked out of the box. And like another interesting thing is I got all new monitors. I've got three 32 inch 240 hertz monitors and all three of them picked up that they were 240 hertz across the board. Whereas in Windows they all recognized as 60 hertz and even my work Mac recognized them as 60 hertz. So it detected my hardware better than the other OS options could. So all of that is just really cool to see. I've been on Linux for a week now. What are my final thoughts? Linux is more viable than ever as a gamer's daily OS. But is it for everyone? Probably not. Now I kept rewriting that part because in my mind it's just not as set and forget as Windows. But in reality it is. Aside from things like mounting SIF shares, which actually now that I think about it is definitely set and forget. You enter in a bit of text and it literally just does all the mounting for you. Um, yeah, it is as straightforward as Windows, it's just different. Now if you're thinking of making the leap, be aware that it's different and Linux doesn't work the same way Windows does. But there are communities out there that have tons of helpful information, answers to questions, solutions to problems and stuff like that. Like Linux is built on community and there is way more community information out there that is truly helpful than you would usually find with Windows. And finally, if there's anything that you wanted to know about my migration, feel free to drop a comment below and I'd be happy to answer. Um, thanks for watching and happy gaming!